The system also supports um, Google account-based authentication, so you don't have to worry about having a shared secret. And so there, quicker than I could point it out, it went ahead and started synchronizing. In this case, it just downloaded the officer list for Jehudi, which is pretty small. And this is actually a sample data set, so I've made it a little bit smaller. But to get started, it just got the officer list. Um, that was to allow the application to start requesting more data, but just data on a per officer basis. So I'll hit done. Gives me a dialog where I can choose which officer I want. So I'll choose it. And now the synchronization system notices more data has been requested that it doesn't have yet. So it just starts synchronizing. And this is actually a, a native um, synchronization component on Android. So you can see it has the same sort of um, rainbow wheel or whatever up in the corner that you might have from Gmail, because Android's aware that it's synchronizing. And this is all happening in a separate application as well. So you can keep using your Android phone or keep using the application while it syncs. So now it's downloading a fair amount of information for this loan officer. Um, it takes about three minutes in this case to get all the data. It's, a, it's about a year and a half worth of data for this loan officer. So while that's going, I'll jump back to the presentation, but we'll come back. Like, this is an edited version of Jehudi's. You can see it's running on Windows, because that's where most of these uh, systems run on. And it's, the system itself is in Python, um, but it tells me where I want to store the data, tells me where I'm going to upload it to. There's a single shared app, app engine application you can use, actually. You don't even have to run your own store server. You can use a single shared application that I have that uh, will keep everyone data, everyone's data segmented by organization. In any case, then you, you put in the command that will access the SQL Server. In any case, for uh, Microsoft SQL, SQL command, you tell it that that's how you run a SQL statement. And then here you put in a SQL statement. And this is a moderately complex SQL statement. Some of them for Jehudi actually are really complicated, almost a page long, of, you know, group buys and so forth. But it's actually a nice way to compress your logic. As soon as you have this give you the data that you want, give you like a CSV you might work with, it takes care of the rest of it from there. So here you can see I've uh, renamed some fields that were possibly poorly named by uh, earlier things that worked on, normalized the names of the field, um, combined a couple tables, and given it one piece of output that I wanted. This is what you would, the command you would run, usually to start the upload agent. And when you run the upload agent, what it does is it goes and talks to the SQL server. In this case, for an example, I'm using SQLite as a SQL server. It exports the data, gets a diff of the data, and then uploads anything that's changed. If it finds that nothing's changed, has no work to do, and it's done, and that's marked that it's gotten that far. In this case, uh, there was nothing to do because nothing changed, so it completed. But if I tell it and make a change, the way that some application might, or the way you might from working with that server, so here's example command. I'll change the database. I'll change someone's savings balance. Then I run the upload agent again. Now you can see this time it found a change. And it's going to upload to my local App Engine development environment here the one line that changed that it detected at the database. So that's really all it does in order to keep the system synchronized. Now, the way the store server works is, again, designed to be really easy to use and to reuse. So if I go here and search, like, for, sorry, previous command. Um, if I send, if I fetch this URL, I'm going to get in my local development server for samples, the organization, and for officer. It just gives me a list of the officers in JSON. So it makes it pretty easy to integrate with other systems. It also supports queries, like saying I want to know the loan groups this officer has. And it gives me just his loan groups. Of course, there's one more query component you add, which is give me everything since this date. And it does that as well, which I won't show here. So now if we go back to the emulator, in the background, it's finished getting this data. And so that means that it's done. And so now I'll actually go ahead, and now that the sync system has completed, I'll give you guys a quick demo of the simple MFI application, which is actually why I built this. So now the sync system exits. 
And now simple MFI is running. So now earlier I selected one officer that I wanted. And now that officer is in here because it's populated the database. So this is what a loan officer would use every day. Same thing that they would use on this IDS phone. The loan officer will go select their name. And then they choose the group that they want to work with. Most loan officers uh, in our organization have maybe a few hundred groups. It can vary. Um, so they'll go and figure out which group meeting they're attending that afternoon. Maybe it's this woman's landing group. And then when you get into the interface of the application, the main system has three tabs. The collection sheet, which shows you who owes how much money. And that's the most important thing to have at a, a microfinance meeting. You arrive there and say, each person needs to pay this much. And if you know that information and you know it exactly, you aren't just sort of scribbling it in the matatu on the way over there, you're actually much more effective, right? Because if, uh, if you owe someone money and someone knows exactly how much you owe at the, at the beginning, it's better than sort of figuring it out halfway through the meeting. So this is what they use to figure out who owes what. And lines are colored differently if someone's in arrears, if they missed a payment last month, if they haven't paid enough. <coughs> the view also has um, a receipt view. Um, since uh, our MFI, along with a lot of our MFIs, we get paper receipts that come in from the bank to show how much someone's paid. Um, so this shows you, for a specific receipt, who paid how much. It's a great way to figure out errors or problems that may have happened. And also a view of all clients, um, because some clients don't have loans yet. Okay, so I can go and choose someone, like Joyce here. And then when I click on them, I actually get a detailed view of the client that shows me the loans that they've had, loans that, have already, that are currently active, loans that they've paid off, how much savings they have, and all their transactions. So again, the application's pretty standard. This isn't anything that's that surprising to do. But the thing that was interesting about it is that the simple MFI application actually knows nothing about the synchronization system. It's built just like a sample Android application that uses some SQL commands from a content provider. It doesn't need to know anything about how it gets the data or how it works. It'll just be synced based on the, the time period that you ask it to sync locally. That also means that it doesn't need data connectivity. You can choose to just sync when you're in the office with Wi-Fi, sync once a week if you want, or sync it just for a few minutes a day. You can use the Minutely plan, that's cheaper for you. And so it's got a few other features. Most of them just get to be a little bit more specific for or microfinance itself um, about schedules and grace periods and so forth. But in essence, that's what the application does and uh, what it allows someone to do. So and that is simple MFI, and that's the Mantis Sync framework that he uses. So that's what I'd worked on, and I think my, my hope is that I can find some other people who also might be interested in working with either the Sync framework or with simple MFI. Right now, in Jehudi, we have um, one office that's using the app already with these phones. It's going pretty well. Uh, we're going to roll it out to the rest of our loan officers pretty soon. There's been various other people I've been talking to who are interested as well. But again, this was, I built this framework with um, the specific needs of Kenya in mind, what I saw, seeing about where the databases actually are, where I saw the problems being, where the systems where the data is locked up, how things are losing connectivity, and also what this phone is capable of, is I had to optimize the system quite a bit because my like, uh, more expensive Android phone from the US system ran really well, but as soon as I put it on the ideas, it's a lot slower. Certain things need to be made to go a lot faster because uh, when you use the actual Jehudi data set, there's something like uh, 200,000 rows from the database that go in there. So it gets a little slow loading on the phone. Anyways, it tries to keep up with those things. So. That is all that I have to say about Manta, the simple MFI. So the next thing, as I said, I would talk about three things today. The other thing I was just going to talk about um, was a quick bio of myself, because uh, people asked me to do that. So I will talk about that. Um, so myself, um, some background on me. I am from a, I'm from California. I grew up in a pretty rural area in California, uh, a place that, California is a pretty big region in the United States, a pretty big state. And so I grew up in an area that's um, pretty dry, it's an agricultural area that's 
It's maybe like five hours away from a big city, uh, five hours away by driving. So it was a small town. My parents had moved there when I was um, in the, you know, I guess I was like 10 or 12. Um, and for me, it was a big adjustment because it was a pretty poor area. It was an area that didn't have really good schools. It didn't have a lot of great opportunities. It has a lot of crime and a lot of problems. It's not a very nice area inside of California to live. Um, though it's still the United States, there's a lot of benefits of being there. But inside the state of California, it's deemed the area with a lot of problems with drugs and violence. But I was living there, I, I think I got really into programming, something that I really enjoyed, really liked programming, playing with computers and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so I think a lot of the things that I did there growing up, they informed a lot of the things that I wanted to do later in my life. Um, when I was there, I was really into uh, programming with HyperCard, which is a system that allows you to make applications pretty easily. It's pretty outdated now, but I found even when I was young, I was really excited to be able to build apps and share them with other people. But in any case, I, uh, I lived there in California for a while. I sort of um, struggled a little bit with not having as many great opportunities and seeing how, um, you know, like uh, at that time, uh, I was trying to use things like uh, AOL, before they had the internet, you know, on like a dial-up modem line, and it was extremely expensive, running up big phone bills for my family, because it was far away from things. And again, I felt like uh, things were on the cusp, but I wanted to be able to access it more, and maybe help more people, give more people access to that. I think that informed my thinking later. From then, I went on to university. I studied at Stanford, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I went there for my undergraduate and for my graduate studies in computer science. I did a master's after my uh, bachelor's degree. While I was in undergraduate, I studied, um, I did some internships, and I interned at IBM, um, which was interesting. I had a good time there. Uh, this was quite some time ago, but they had a pretty good internship program, and so it was a nice opportunity for me to live on the East Coast of the United States, as the office I was working with was in Boston. So I, I got to learn a lot uh, after the, because of that. When I graduated, I worked at IBM for a couple years. Um, that was a really good experience for me because I got to experience working at a really big company. Uh, one that's a little bit dysfunctional, too. There's a lot of great things about IBM and most really, really big companies. Um, but there's a lot of bad things, too. And so I think I learned a lot from working in a really big organization that had, uh, again, some strengths and some weaknesses, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of problems, and I think a lot of ways where they weren't, um, they didn't treat engineers as well. They didn't really like respect um, how an engineer wants to build things, wants to design things, had a lot of um, politics and so forth. So after working there for a while, a friend of mine was working at Google, said I should come over and work there. So I investigated it, gave it a shot. That was really refreshing because Google was a really small company at that point in time. So it felt totally different. All these ideas where you had like a lot of autonomy, you could do whatever you want, you could have like, what you guys may have read about, like 20% time to build your own thing, be in charge of your projects. I thought that was really exciting. But I think the, the part I appreciated, I was able to appreciate them more because I'd worked in this not so great environment for a while. I think if I'd always been in this environment that felt really nice, uh, where I was, uh, well treated and able to do all these things, I might not have appreciated it as much. When I worked at Google, when I started there, I worked in their systems infrastructure group, which is a group that does a lot of our large scale systems, usually for web search, but other things. Things that um, scale hundreds of thousands of computers and a lot of data centers and that sort of stuff, distributed systems. So I worked on that and that was really interesting. I learned a lot. Um, in my spare time, though, I wanted to do a 20% project because I thought it was really cool that you could do that and that Google was really permissive. I think the thing that, um, maybe my single favorite thing about working at Google versus working at IBM was how um, in Google's culture, it's the job of your manager um, not to say yes to anything you want to do, but to say no. Which is to say, it's assumed that anything you want to do, you can do it unless they can give you a really good reason why you're not allowed to do that. Which, of course, it's the opposite at IBM, where you had to get approval for anything you wanted to do. I remember being on like a conference call, a series of conference calls for three months, 
uh, in order to try to put a wiki system online in IBM just for internal use, just for other engineers to communicate with each other. And the final decision was, we don't know. So <laughs> it was very frustrating. Um, so I really liked it at Google. You could sort of do stuff and just get it going. So um, that led to me uh, making the autocomplete feature, Google Suggest, which is something I've been working on. I made a demo for it, showed it to some people, and they got really excited. They said, oh, you should totally do this and launch that. So I did. So it worked out pretty well. Um, after I made the initial prototype of it and launched it so everyone could use it, I stopped working on it after that point in time because I wasn't interested in it anymore. Um, but other people uh, continued to work on it and finish the rest of it. Uh, it was around that time, or it was a few years in at Google, um, then I became interested in trying to do another project. But I wanted to work with some other people that I knew, some people that I respected and met at Google, to try to do something more ambitious and start a bigger project. And so at that point, I got some friends together. And we brainstormed. And we came up with the idea of doing App Engine. So we grew the project out from there. Um, so then we worked on it steadily for a long time. And you know, I think with, with most startups, most ideas, most projects, whether they're within a big company or on their own, ideas definitely evolve over time. You know, you start with one idea, it changes, you do some other things and so forth. And we had that happen a lot with App Engine. I think it helped a lot that those three values I told you about at the beginning of the talk, that we wanted to make it easy to use, easy to scale, and free to get started. We didn't start with those, but maybe like about a year in or so, we felt pretty confident those were the values we cared about. And then we stuck with them for all the time after that. I think that was really helpful, even as our ideas changed and what we were doing changed, because we knew what we cared about and what we wanted to focus on. So um, that's the project that I did and still do uh, at Google uh, once I get back to San Francisco. Um, about a, a few years ago, I transitioned within the team. I'm still the technical lead for the team, but I transitioned to doing management for the team as well, managing the engineers on the team and the overall effort. I think that was a really big uh, growth challenge for me because that wasn't anything I'd ever planned to do. I really enjoy doing engineering and uh, something that I liked doing and I got paid well for doing it. And so I didn't really see any reason to change that. Um, but one of my bosses um, sort of challenged me and said that, you know, we really need someone to do this. I think you're the right person to do it. Um, will you please do this? And I felt really awkward about it because I didn't want to lose the ability to do engineering because I'm very passionate about it. Um, but I did do it. And, you know, it's something that I, I think I grew a lot from. I learned a lot about. And now I've done management for a long time for engineering management. I think it's something that's uh, an interest of mine. I think it's something that I enjoy doing and I really enjoy working with my team because we've worked together for a long time. Um, but it's something that I think is, a, is an interesting topic, uh, managing engineers and how to be a good manager. So if that's something any of you guys have a question about or want to talk about, I'm going to be glad to talk about. And I think that concludes my bio. And this uh, concludes the presentation that I was going to show you guys. Um, so beyond that, I just really wanted to open it to questions for you guys, for really anything that you might want to ask, whether it's about me or about, um, excuse me, the, anything in my background, anything about Google, anything about the Manta framework or simple MFI, anything about management, or just like a, how do I use this feature in the data store, anything you want. So I have uh, two questions from the Google App Engine and three questions from the Mata app. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So on the Google App Engine, here are the two. Uh, can you talk a bit more about multi-threading as we traditionally know it, as we traditionally know it in, in Java, for instance? Um, uh, someone transitioning to Google App Engine trying to transition their multi-thread code into Google App Engine. And that's one. Uh, the second one, Google App Engine, is do you have, uh, do you have uh, migration tools, uh, especially uh, when it comes to something like migrating existing SQL databases? I saw in the Manta framework you have to build something. So I was just asking whether there are existing migration tools. Uh, 
probably the biggest thing to get your head around, uh, and it's why one of the things I listed in the differences, it is really about the data. That's usually the biggest stumbling block people hit in trying to, um, to move an existing application data. So, you know, most Java frameworks, most libraries, work okay on that. We have a page where you can see specifically, but most of them now do work well. And what we're meaning, things don't work, we're working hard to fix those to make sure anything does work. But because we don't provide SQL servers on that page, we, uh, we are doing some trusted testing of that, and we are going to eventually provide SQL servers as part of that page. But because it's not the primary thing we provide as part of our scalability system, um, thinking about how to change your system from using SQL, if that's what you're using now, to using an object-based database, that's the, the most important thing to think about. And I think if I was gonna give someone advice about moving their app over, the thing that I would probably advise first is to really learn the data store inside and out. You know, know what it can do so it feels natural to you. You know, you know what, what its limits are. So maybe build some sample apps, even play around with Python if you want, because it's the same, um, if that's easier for hacking, because it's the same data store underneath. Um, and then once you really feel like, oh, okay, I see what I can do and what I can't do, then you'll be able to adapt your data storage layer so that it can work with that well. And probably what you can do is come up with an abstraction for your storage layer that works just fine with both SQL and the data store. Then you're in a good spot. You can put it in either, in either place. But that's probably what I would recommend first for wrapping your head around that vision. In general, if you don't store any data and you have a, a WAR file, you deploy it app engine, it just runs. So there's not all, I mean, there are definitely other things to learn, but most of it's are pretty straightforward, I think. So that's what I would probably suggest first. You know, for migration um, over to App Engine, the, the two things I think probably help the most. Are one, we have a local development environment. And what that means um, is that, it, you know, it's, uh, for Java, it's maybe not as surprising. People are used to using servlet containers locally. In a scripting language, maybe not so much, right? Maybe you set up Apache locally, maybe you don't. Um, but for App Engine, we provide a whole local development environment, which emulates all of these APIs on the server. So that's a good way, I think, to iterate very quickly, especially here, right, where connectivity may be worse. Um, I find it's much better because I can move much more quickly on my laptop. But more specifically about migration, we do have tools to help you um, bulk upload data so you can move a lot of data into the server if you need to do that once you know how you're going to store it. Um, we also have, we're working on improving those tools and making them better. So I think that's one of the other primary migration tools that you might use in order to get the data to where the application is. The multi-threading. Oh, sorry. Multi-threading. I asked about uh, multi-threading. Oh, multi-threading. Yeah. Um, so uh, did you, so threading is a change um, between it. You know, the, the best way to understand how multi-threading works on App Engine is remember how I was talking about earlier that App Engine tries to sort of separate the front ends and the back ends so that we can scale your application best. And threading is a part of that. You know, for most of the time, if you're having, um, you're preparing a web, a web response for the user for their request, well, it has to run somewhere. It's going to run inside of a thread. And the best thing to do is to allow us to control those threads in doing the response. So generally, the, the best way to make multi-threading work well on App Engine is actually don't use threads is the answer. The threads will be used as needed when your requests come in. Um, now, what I, I don't recall for certain right now, because I have been away for a little while, we have a desire, certainly, over time to provide um, multi-threaded Java. I don't know if that's yet available or still in testing, but it's something that we're continuing to work towards on App Engine. Um, so with, uh, with our RPC system, when you're making API calls to our internal uh, system, we provide a way of dealing with that so that you don't need to use threads. But again, that's something where, because it, it starts to be on the edge of my memory now, because of when I left, if you read up on the groups, you can learn a little bit more about that between multi-threading and Java. Um, I have a few questions about the Mentor framework. And you said you, you kind of wanted it to be able to do, to use it for data collection. That was the impression I got. Um, but, from your presentation, your cycle, I didn't see any feedback going back to the office uh, thing. How, how are you planning for that? Because, yeah, you're synchronized between the cloud uh, mm -hmm. 
and the mobile unit, that's very fine, but really it needs to go back to the office. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, you know, right now, it does not go back to the database. And actually, I think I, I probably gave the wrong impression. For what I'm doing um, at Jakuti, there was actually no need for it to go back to the database in the head office. Because in fact, what the loan officers need is data that we already have in the head office computer. They need to know all their clients, all their groups, who's got payments, uh, who's in arrears, all their previous historic payments and all of that. But actually making a payment of course, it happens through different routes. It's not good, in, you know, because it's finance. We, we can't just take their word that a payment has been made, right? It needs to actually come into the accounting arm and go in that way. So as it turns out, it's actually fine that they can't enter data back into the database. Now, what you can do in Manta is the synchronization between the sync agent on the phone and the store, the JSON database, is bidirectional. So you can change data or add columns, do whatever you'd like. And that is persistently stored in the JSON server in the cloud, which means that although in the current system you can't change the data in the SQL database, you can annotate it. You can add new data to it, right? You can add a new column, add a note, add a flag, something is incorrect, do things like that and extend the data, which I found to be pretty powerful because in a lot of ways, like, um, I was seeing that we were using division in the office to do more things maybe than it needed to do, right? Because it was the only system out there. It's the only hammer we have. Everything looks like a division nail. And that's where we put new functionality. But in fact, um, with Manta, we're able to uh, have division focus on the finances, and we can add more data in the store server in the cloud. But to answer your question more head on, though, you're right. Right now, it doesn't support putting data back into the SQL server. Part of the problem with that is that that's actually um, less generic than pulling data out. No harm done if you pull data out of a SQL server, no matter how it's stored. But in general, most applications won't like it in, because they're depending on sort of a single writer model. Won't like it if you stick other data in there. Now, it is possible to build something that writes it back because the sync framework provides you exactly with what you need, right? It would be easy to build a little Python application that just pulls the server, says, tell me the changes since this date, finds all the changes because it knows which they are. It can tell which ones were written by the database and which ones weren't. And then you can write some code that inserts it back into your system in whatever is the safe way, which I'm going to imagine probably necessitates using some other API. Either, you know, in this case, maybe it would be uh, Microsoft Navision's API, uh, making like an XML port. But it might be something else in another system. Or you can insert it to the database directly. So it would be easy to build that part, but you're right, I haven't built that part. And more questions <laughs> uh, about capacity. Since you're, you're syncing everything to the, to the end device, mm -hmm. uh, are you in, in danger of running out of the capacity there? How do, yeah. how do you handle that? So it's a good question. Um, the answer is two, actually. One, it doesn't sync. Uh, it doesn't sync everything. It actually only syncs a slice. And you notice, right, um, when at first we got the list of officers, yeah. then I chose an officer yeah. and it got some. Um, that's because it wasn't downloading all records for all officers. Um, now, as it turns out, um, because these phones use SQLite, and SQLite's actually pretty efficient, and these things have, I don't know, two to eight gigs of storage on them, it could probably hold everything on it and run fine once the data's there. But it's very slow to insert that data with transactions onto the phone. So that's why I only pick out a slice that is specifically needed. And actually, in, in the internals of Manta, it's based around the idea of having a facet on the data, which is sort of the element that you can use to slice all of the data. In this case, it's using officer ID. Um, and it has special logic so that, because um, I found there were weird corner cases. If we moved uh, a lending group between two officers, it was a problem because suddenly it shows up on the new officer, but the, the old officer still has it, except it's...